about the certificate series. Um, so as you see on the screen, these are all of our sessions for the year. Um, we have them yeah, all the way through April, uh, April being the celebration. So the next session will be September 20th, and it's another core content session. And so we'll kind of talk to you about what it takes to actually get your certificate. This will be the first session, so hopefully all of you signed in, and then um, I'll kind of walk you through what that looks like. So to actually gain your certificate, you need to attend five sessions over the 2016-2017 academic year. Um, four of the sessions must be core content. And you'll see that on all of our, um, of our programming when we actually kind of demarcate core content and the ones that are actually school focused. Um, so four of your sessions, like I said, must be core content. The fifth session must be an additional either school focused or core content. And the reason why we do that is because we want you all to also experience some different um, health professions, right? So if you want to actually go to the public health se uh, session, those are open to you as well. But you'll get a little bit different um, of a curriculum that way, right? Like, so you'll learn a little bit uh, different skills. And we'll also have a physical session and a nursing session as well as a medical session. So look out for those four school focused sessions as well. Um, and again, particularly for some of you who are digital students, you might want to particularly go into the digital session. So that's up to you. Um, we built that in for you to make a little bit of a choice about the sessions that you would like to attend to complete your certificate. Um, we will also have the sessions recorded online. Those will be on the LGBT Health Certificate Series website. Um, you go to that page and underneath the session, there will have there will be a uh, link to the recorded session. You click that, watch the session, then do the online assessment, and that's how you gain your credit. Right? So you can still do this online if you can't make it in for a session. Particularly if there's a session you would like to kind of be a part of, say you want to know more about health disparities, and you have to miss that session, you can actually go online and watch that. So there's other ways for you to as well kind of get your credit for that. Um, and then, yeah, make sure you sign in. This is a quick little picture of our celebration last year. This is what you have to look forward to in April. Um, and I hope all of you make it. Um, and hope to see all, all of you there for that. Um, it was really, really good, good time. Um, this kind of talks about our, our certificate series. We're actually in the fourth year of the certificate series. Um, you can see some of the actual responses. So every year we're kind of doing better, you know, with how many people are actually earning certificates. 94% um, of respondents found that the session provided information useful for their work or education. So again, I know a lot of you are students, but a lot of you are from the community as well. So hopefully these skills translate to, to your own profession, some of the things that you do as well. Um, today's session is the introduction session, so the introduction to LGBT health. Um, we'll talk about um, basically the context, patient experiences, and then some key terms to kind of ground the rest of the discussion for the rest of the year. And so I really do love this session, it's my favorite, and I hope you all came with questions, because this is really the time to get those questions answered. We have a great panel, and they'll sort of do some of that work. The next session, like I said, is September 20th. Um, it will be in B215, so right down the hall. And it'll talk about the disparities, health and legal, that affect the LGBT and DSD communities. Uh, and then how we can be supportive and affirming in that and kind of work around some of those disparities. So today we're gonna give you a little bit of the why and then on the next session, we'll give you this is what it looks like. This is how it shows up in people's actual day-to-day -day lives, right? Um, as well, I always have to plug HSC Pride. If you are not part of HSC Pride, you should be. Uh, it is our student RSO group. Uh, we actually have our first general interest meeting tomorrow. Um, it would be noon and B102, so right underneath us. And then as well on Thursday, we have a networking night, and I'm really excited for that as well, because it's a chance for everyone, particularly students, to interface with some of their healthcare professionals. So 
some of your professors, some other people in the community, and we can kind of build some relationships. Fun, cool part is it's gonna be a play. And so if you've never been to play, again, it's just another chance, right? So uh, we definitely hope you all come out for those two, two events. Um, I'm actually going to now pass it over to Stacy, um, the director of the LGBT Center Satellite Office here on HSC, and she will take you through the rest of the session. So thank you all for being here. Nice, good. Stacy, before I get started, does anybody need a napkin? <laughs> <laughs>
So let's talk a little bit at health and healthcare disparities. One of the things that I think is most important to understand about health and healthcare disparities is that they're preventable. These are things that don't have to exist, but they exist because of um, social determinants of health like discrimination or bias. And so if you look at this first one, um, this is really speaking to us within the healthcare system. How can we make sure that our healthcare system is, is open, accepting, and affirming to LGBT people? And so um, what you can see there is that um, things like harsh language, denial of care, or blaming the patient are all playing into people calling my office and saying, please help me find an LGBT friendly and competent physician. And I'll just share a personal story with you. Um, when I first came out in my 20s, and I was in my first relationship with a woman, I identified as bisexual at the time. I saw a new physician, and I was trying very hard to be very honest. I'm a compliant patient, if you can imagine. <laughs> very honest about my identity, which you know not everyone you know, would, would feel comfortable doing, and I was very nervous about that. And so I told her that I was bisexual, and I described um, why I was there for health care. There was a, a health you know, reason for me to be there. And she listened, and she kind of looked at me, and eventually she said, well, you can just stop there. Because what's clear to me is that your health problems are being caused by the fact that you're bisexual. And she pretended to hold up two ice cream cones and then pretended to lick them and say, it's because you can't decide if you like chocolate or vanilla butter. <laughs> I love your face. That's how I felt. <laughs> Wonderful or horrible experiences. 
something to understand about the physical environment for transgender people is that they are targeted for enormous amounts of physical violence. So um, not surprising to come to our last statistic. And this is really like a clarion call for us, a wake-up call. There is a, a public health crisis around transgender folks and mental health because of the um, extreme discrimination that they experience. So we have the chance to really change that. So let's talk a little bit about basic sexuality concepts. This is our friendly gingerbread person. Um, <laughs> is I'm going to map myself to the gingerbread person and I'm going to invite all of you to take a deep breath and get brave and think about our sexual concepts rather than a binary either or. Think about them as a continuum and where would you place yourself on the continuum? So this first one is gender identity and that really has to do with um, how you think of yourself in your head. You'll see the gingerbread person having that little rainbow colored brain up there. So um, all of us have the gender identity. Some of us would identify more as woman or as man. Some of us would identify more as gender queer or gender non-conforming, somewhere in the middle. So for myself, for gender identity, I have always very clearly thought myself to be a woman. Gender expression is in our outward expression of our gender identity to the world. And for this, some people would um, have a gender uh, expression that is more female, some more as um, uh, more as masculine and some more androgynous as a combination of both male and female, or perhaps neither. And so for this one, my gender expression is generally pretty feminine, especially in my work environment, but if I'm not hiking, camping, working out, it's much more androgynous. And I wouldn't take it as an affront if people mistook me for a man, for example. So I'm pretty comfortable kind of sliding across that continuum there, depending on my environment that I'm in. Then we come to biological sex, right? So chromosomes, hormones. Um, so some people are born and uh, the sex assigned at birth is clearly female, so clearly male. And then there are many people who are intersex or DSD, differences in sex development. And um, the, the numbers of DSD people are much higher than, than people often imagine because biology happens to love diversity. So not a surprise there, actually. So biologically, um, doctors said, hey, you've got a girl, and all of my biology has borne out that, indeed, um, I'm, I'm female according to biological sex. And then we come to sexual orientation, and that's really about who are you attracted to? Who makes you blush? Who gives you butterflies in your stomach? This is innate to us. This is something that we can't pretend. This is something that can't be um, trained out of us. This is an innate part of who we are. Just Try to imagine like, who it is that you're attracted to and changing that in some way through some program. There have been many programs that have been tried to change sexual orientation, by the way, and they have all failed miserably. So when we're talking about sexual orientation, some people very clearly identify as heterosexual or homosexual. Many people actually identify somewhere there on that continuum as bisexual. Personally, the label that perhaps feels the most fitting to me is pansexual, and that means when you have the capacity to be attracted to people who are um, female, male, or transgender, or somewhere on that gender spectrum. So it doesn't mean I find everyone in the room attractive, just for the information, <laughs> it just means that I have a wonderful capacity to be able to love people um, who might have a variety of different gender identities. Okay, so, um, there's some packets that people picked up as you came in that had terms on them. If you don't have that packet, that's okay. We're going to be emailing it out to you. That packet is seven pages of terms. There are so many amazing terms out there. So let's do a little historical context for that. When you look, when you're part of a population where other people have named you, and most of those names have been fairly unforgiving, you tend to name yourself, and you come up with a lot of creative ways to kind of take back that power of naming. And so. Um, in those terms, there are a couple of ones that I want to call attention to, and one is queer. And I'm calling attention to that because for many of us here in the room, hearing that term is like a punch in the stomach. You're like, whoa, please do not say that word again. What I will say is that the term queer is something that the LGBTQ community has really taken back and has been imbued with positive and powerful meaning to say, yes, we're queer. We're going to take that word back and we're going to use it positively. And so you will definitely meet people in your line of work who identify as queer. Um, as you're working with them as a healthcare provider, keep in mind that it's very important to mirror people's language. So despite being uncomfortable with that term, what you can do here is say, okay, 
Deep breath. We can deep breath, folks. So I hear you use the term queer to describe yourself. Please tell me more about what that means to you. It means very different things to different people. So this is a great information gathering tool. Tell me what it means to you. Um, and then, and then hear your patient's language. If it's a, if it's a term that you just can't bring yourself to say, you're just like, no, <laughs> I was called that from the time I was five until fifteen, and I will, I just can't say that word anymore for whatever reason. You can't say it. You can always ask your patient. So that term's really hard for me to say, but I really want to honor you and your identity. Are there any other terms that you like that I could use? So that's also okay to ask folks for. Um, so when you're asking patients how they identify, one of the ways to do that is on your forms. So that can be a very tricky thing to do. We know that forms are hard to change, but um, the Fenway Institute, so that's F-E-N-W-A-Y, the Fenway Institute does tons of research on how to ask those questions about sexual orientation and gender identity. If you're looking for a good form, that's where you can go to find it. Um, so, although there are many, many terms on that Sorry. sheet, and you are more than welcome, it's okay. <laughs> it's and you are more than welcome <laughs> to read all of those and memorize all of them. Keep in mind that the best thing you can do is be practicing these skills around asking what what identities people have and what they mean to them. Now you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> and now, happily, I will introduce our panel. And so, um, panelists, if you will, please come on up and. Sit here with us. So panels are such a blessing to all. Um, this is really a gift to get to hear from people in the community about their personal experiences. So people will be talking about their experiences with healthcare, but also with healthcare providers and the environment for healthcare providers who identify within the community. Um, what I'm going to ask is that you will continue to be the amazing audience you are and showing um, respect for our panelists um, by listening and not having computer screens up, which I only does thank you for that. Um, and um, each person is going to, I'm going to do a bio for each person, and then I'm going to throw them out a couple of questions, and they are going to um, bravely answer those questions, <laughs> and you will decide how you want to pass the mic. Um, and then we're also going to be taking questions from the audience. So after each question, we'll take a pause and take questions um, from you all. So please uh, ask lots of questions. This is the appropriate and wonderful place and time to be asking those. So um, first up is Gary Bryce. Gary, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, Bryce is a queer rap artist, actor, playwright, producer, activist, and entrepreneur, also known as Educated Rebel. He released his debut rap EP in 2014 titled Open Mic Night. Open Mic Night 2, the prequel, 2016. He holds an MFA in theater arts from UofL, and in 2015 started a line of wooden bow ties called rebellious bow ties. Do you have any Oh! Sounds awesome. He's a good one to show off, but... Um, okay, well, maybe we can email something up to folks so they know what wooden bow ties look like and have fun. Currently, he's the lead organizer for Black Lives Matter Global's Arts and Culture team. Thank you, Gary Bryce, for being here with us. <laughs> and next, we have Andrea Sinclair. Andrea is the program coordinator for the Bioethics and Medical Humanities program. She claims to be a sex and gender nerd. I love that. <laughs> She's aspiring therapist to the Quilt Bag community, and I will let you explain Quilt Bag community as you talk. My undergraduate degree was in philosophy and fine arts, photography, and Andrea was the first was in the first graduating class of the bioethics program. Andrea is currently pursuing an MED in counseling psychology, along with being a wife and mother, and all the other roles she fulfills every day. I'm a maker, she says, and complicated is my key word. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea uh, identifies as cisgender, so cisgender means that your gender identity aligns with the sex you're assigned at birth and uses uh, she, her, hers as pronouns. So thank you, Andrea, for being here with us. <laughs> Down at the end is Michael Boy. You want to give us a little wave, Michael? <laughs> Great. Michael is a master's prepared registered nurse with a degree from the University of Kentucky at Bellarmine University. He has been in healthcare for over 40 years as a radiologic te technologic, no, Technologist, thank you, <laughs> words, and nurse with a focus in emergency room, critical care nursing, and education. He has worked for the Kentucky Board of Nursing and is currently employed by University of Louisville Physicians as a senior trainer. 
He's taught in several different health professional schools in Kentucky, published in several books, and was previously on the national speaker circuit. Michael has two adult sons and a grandchild on the way. He and his husband, Christoph, were married on Valentine's Day 2016. Thank you for being here with us. <laughs> Dr. Charette practiced dental hygiene for five years before joining the 2013 graduating class at the University of Royal School of Dentistry. Upon completion of the DMD program, Dr. Charette earned a certificate in the specialty of prosthodontics and now serves as faculty at U of L School of Dentistry as discipline coordinator for complete removable. Dr. Charette takes pride in advocating for a diverse population of patients and welcomes members of all communities to a safe and inclusive environment where they can receive superior individualized care. Dr. Charette is married and a proud parent and a nine-month-old daughter. Thank you for being here. <laughs> okay, first question for our panelists, and Andrea offered to briefly kick this off for us, so I'm going to go ahead and hand you mic. How does your identity, an identity uh, writ large, in terms of age, race, sexuality, gender identity, expression, ability, and so on, affect your relationship with the medical or healthcare field? One of the things that I really got to thinking about when Chaz sent us those questions was how kind of disappointing it is that I have just about everything in my identifiers that should give me basically flawless interactions with the healthcare system. I am white, I am privileged, I am educated, right? Like I can speak very well, I'm fluent, in my native language, the healthcare professionals that I meet share my native language. I communicate really well, and I understand what they're saying to me very well, and I understand the importance of what they're telling me, and how much it matters that I do what they say to get the results that they're offering me. And yet, I have the same level of horror stories as a whole lot of people that I know do. And that's really disappointing because what that tells me is that there is no such thing as a perfect patient who avoids these problems. That means they're systemic. That means that it's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's an everything problem. And I think that's one of the things that's really important to start kind of wrapping your head around when you start running into the question you're embarrassed to ask or when you don't understand something it's probably okay that you don't understand this yet. You maybe have never had a chance to even think about it this way. Nobody has ever framed it this way for you before. Maybe nobody has offered you the chance to ask that silly question that you kind of like, maybe this is gonna be a really dumb thing to say. So I really wanted to reiterate what Stacy said about let this be that safe place, right? I'm not gonna hate anybody in here for asking me a question. You know, maybe it's a little like silly, maybe you don't know this, this seems really obvious to me. There's nothing that says it could be obvious to you. Okay? Who wants to jump in next? In case y'all hadn't noticed, I'm the old one sitting up here. <laughs> <laughs> and I put something different on the information that uh, Chad sent me, but I'm going to tell you all what happened. Um, as I said, I'm sick, well, I'm in an intergenerational relationship. I'm 62, and it's my <coughs> husband. <laughs> you know how hard that is to come out of my mouth? <laughs> my husband is 23. And I had to have some health care taken care of recently, and he went with me. And for the first time, it hit me like a ton of bricks. They started asking me questions, and I realized I was not prepared. My oldest son is still my sur uh, health care surrogate. He is the benefactor of my will. All of these things hit me, and they came from all the health care professionals that I met that morning. And it really, they didn't flinch. Uh, in fact, I had to laugh. Uh, one of the nurses that took care of me, uh, she said, is your family here? And I said, yes, my husband is in the waiting room. And she said, what's his name? And I'm talking. 
And so she went and got her pen back, and those two were chatting like old friends. <laughs> and she never blinked. Here's laying this bad old man and this young, good looking kid. And by the way, just for information, I'm not a sugar daddy. <laughs> just like our, our fellow heterosexual communities out there. Uh, and as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender folks, we need to make sure that we are prepared for you all as healthcare professionals. Okay, so I just want to kind of reiterate also what Stacy was saying about um, kind of the spectrum and, and the gingerbread man or however you want to look at it. Um, you know, for me personally, um, it's been, for all the reasons that you saw on the slide, very difficult for me. Even though I know 90% of the people in this room right now, 90% of the people in this room do not know how I identify. Everyone assumes, you know, I have a wife and I have a child, or they assume that I am a wife, and people don't actually know how I identify. And I don't talk about it because, for me, putting a label like an L, a G, a B, or a T, I think some people look at that as something that identifies or, or puts that person into a box. And I don't like to be put into a box. So I don't really speak much about it outside of that. I don't know if any of you in the room have seen the movie uh, City of Angels. It's an older movie, Nicolas Cage, Meg Ryan. So there's a scene there where she's eating a pear and Nicolas Cage says, what does that taste like? And she's like, what do you mean? And he said, what, what does that pear taste like? And she says, you've never had a pear. And he says, no, I have, but I don't know what a pear tastes like to you. And so to be queer or part of this community is different for all of us. And so how we experience things, there's no, you know, we can do all of these classes and we can talk about what Stacey said, you don't need terms, you don't need um, to know what all the definitions are or to be able to be, you know, know exactly what that person is feeling. What you need is skills and that's just to treat people like, like people and ask the questions and don't assume, you know, don't assume that because my hair is short that I, that I'm transgender or that because of the clothes that I wear that I'm a lesbian or because I have a wife that I'm a lesbian. So, um, you know, I identify more on the trans spectrum. Um, I'm still figuring that out for myself. I'm not, you know, I can't sit here and tell you today I'm a transgender person and exactly what I'm going to do about that, but I'm on that spectrum. And so for me, I experience healthcare in two ways, as a provider and as a patient. So when I go, I have the benefit as Andrea was saying, of understanding how important it is that I answer these questions um, correctly and that I divulge all of the information because how can someone as a provider, I know my provider needs all of that information. They need to know everything in order to be able to properly assess and have all of the tools to diagnose or to be able to come up with a differential diagnosis of what is going on with me. But patients, may assume on their end that those things aren't important. Well, it doesn't matter if I have a same-sex partner or it doesn't matter how I identify or my health, you know, hormones don't affect my health in, in a way that this matters to this doctor, and that may not be true. So um, I think it's really important as providers that we learn that there are differences between the health risks that people in different communities, especially today we're talking about the LGBT community, that those differences matter and that we need to have the tools to assess those things properly. So, I feel like my relationship um, to the healthcare field slash experiences in um, the healthcare field are a bit complex uh, because uh, my grandmother, well, my family was originally from um, the deep south, um, Arkansas. Um, and so my grandmother grew up on um, her Jim Crow. And so um, she told, tells us still to this day lots of stories. Um, from drinking from colored water fountains. Um, but with regards to healthcare, specifically having to wait um, in the back of a doctor's office um, until all of your white patients are gone, um, and then you can see um, the colored people. Um. And so when you insert um, being an LGBT person um, into that equation um, and being a person of color um, and the relationship that the healthcare field has historically had to people of color, um, and the sort of um, mistrust that is bred um, from experiments um, on black women um, in the field of gynecology. 
um, our experiments of, of black men um, with regards to a, a syphilis um, and how black people have been historically marginalized in the, in the healthcare field. Um, fast forward to 2016 um, with a lot of those sort of overt racist practices um, being understood as unethical um, and not being um, overtly practiced anymore, um, but still kind of having that relationship to the healthcare field that's not a personal experience, but it kind of is because it's an, an ancestral experience. <laughs> um, and so um, when you intersect being a person of color um, with being um, a queer person, um, it's really kind of asking the question, what does that mean, what does that look like? So for me, um, a lot of my experiences um, with healthcare providers um, have been pretty okay for the most part, just mostly because I feel like um, my gender performance exists on a spectrum or continuum as the word you use. Um, and so um, I've learned for safety um, how to and when to perform masculinity, um, just to not uh, draw attention to myself and make myself uncomfortable or put myself in a position where I'm forced to face certain triggers that I may have. Um, and so in that sense, it, it's been really easy for me to sort of um, wear the mask, and I don't even know if I like that word, that phrase, <laughs> um, in these situations, but, but then there's a particular situation where I'm going to get um, an HIV test, right? And um, I get tested sorry, <laughs> regularly. Uh, but, you know, I'm also a, a person who likes to, you know, do what I do and still protect myself. That's all I'm saying there. Um, <laughs> but, um, the questions that are being asked about, you know, sexual activity, um, uh, and so, you know, in a situation like that, it's important for me to answer honestly. Um, and, and being with a person who you're not sure um, is going to be sensitive to your lifestyle, or sort of you, you're not sure that they're not going to judge you for your lifestyle choices, um, can provide, um, it's a, it can be a very uncomfortable experience, um, to say the least. Um, and so that's always been a, a, a fear for my of, of mine um, in situations like that, specifically um, for HIV testing when the person is not necessarily um, sensitive um, to um, LGBT, specific LGBT needs um, in a situation like that, which I have experienced in this situation very, very, very uncomfortable. Most uncomfortable 20 minutes of your life. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've taken up too much space. I'm going to take this from you. No, Gary, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> That was wonderful. Thank you so much. So now I'm going to turn this over to you, audience, and hear a couple of your questions before we move on uh, with the panel. So yes, right up here in the front, first brave person, go for it. Hi. Um, I'm from College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, my name is Femi. I use they and their pronouns. And uh, my question has to do with uh, access to advanced care. Um, you know, I, I identify with a lot of the concerns that were brought up, um, especially around trust and uh, sort of navigating performance um, in the doctor's office and how to disclose without feeling, one, like a subject of study where it's like, I'm, I'd like to perhaps have this procedure done to transition and then feeling kind of like there's a little light in the eye, like, ooh, my first, in the, you know, in the doctor's face, and being like, oh, God, right? Um, but the second thing is, and I don't know because I've not experienced, I don't have any experience having biologically um, understood female genitalia, whether if there's something going on down there, as Susan Weed says, um, uh, that your general practitioner has to do a physical examination of that area before you can go to the gynecologist, or if you have sort of a fast track to the gynecologist, and you don't have to go to your general practitioner beforehand. Um, but I disclosed that I had some issues going on in 
I don't know. I'm with doctors, so hopefully I'll <laughs> go in this. Uh, in my sort of, I guess my ass area, uh, to say. And when the doctor said, and I know, right? I know there's something wrong, right? I'm not making it up, and I'm, you know, I know there's something wrong. And the doctor says, okay, well, I'm going to have to physically examine you. And I said, you know, I just want to let you know that that the prostate and that area is a very, is a highly sexual organ to me. Right, and if there's any way that you can avoid fingering me today, um, <laughs> sir, uh, could you just pass me on to the pre to the specialist? Because I'm, I'm really sensitive. And they said, I understand. And then they just asked me to turn around and bend over, and they they did it. And I felt really like frozen um, because I felt that. I needed care, I was worried, and I didn't have any power um, to possibly access, because I was told that this is the person that has the most experience with LGBTQ bodies um, at U of L, and then they said, no, there's nothing really wrong, and then a year later I ended up having to have a polyp removed from my colon, and had to go through the same process and be physically examined again, and it's just been a really, it was just really awful. So I'm wondering if there's any work um, on ways to fast track people who might, and I think a lot of people consider the ass area a sexual area, right? It's not just LGBTQ folks. Um, if there's any way, if somebody says, hey, I don't want to be physically examined down there by you, I'd rather go to the specialist, kind of like, I'm sure if a, if a person with biologically understood that female genitalia said, I don't want to be fingered down there by you, I'd want to go to the gynecologist that that would be on. So I'm wondering mm. if there's any thoughts on that, um, and also if you have any way that I can navigate this in the future that would feel less invasive. And I do see some yeah. MD tags floating in here, so if I misspeak, you won't correct me, okay? As a nurse, I can assure you, <laughs> before I would do anything as far as referring you or giving you ideas or suggestions on where to go, there has to be some doctor patient relationship. Because I am the MDs in the room, would you all make a referral to a specialist like that without ever having examined your patient? I, I, and I don't know, you all may do that. But if I were in that MD shoes, I'm not going to touch you to send a referral until I know what I'm referring. And it's just me. And another piece of it sort of very pragmatically, um, speaking as someone who has walked around with female genitalia, yeah, there was actually insurance, like the laws governing what insurance can can't cover, at least, that said women do have a fast track to a gynecologist. You do not have to go to a primary care. You can say, I don't know if a correlating uh, expectation exists. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that it's ever actually been something that ended up being lobbied for. But what you can do um, there is a lot of really interesting work going on in the idea of trauma-informed care and how a provider interacts with somebody who comes to them and says, look, I have had fill in blank, childhood sexual abuse, traumatic childbirth, right, um, a rape experience or a non-consensual type thing in any phase of your life, anything that might make it so that a particularly unknown person getting very intimate touch is anywhere from difficult to impossible. Um, I know in the dental world, they run into this all the time. Having somebody in your mouth, this is also a very intimate, nerve-rich sexual use area. Genitals, ass, our whole bodies can be sexual and sexualized. And so I think you did the absolute number one thing that you can do. You advocated for yourself. You asked for what you needed, and it was ignored. That's a problem, right? Like, that's a very specific problem. You did not give consent for that touching. You did not give consent for that process. And there's a huge step of, I understand that you're more comfortable going to a specialist. I can't actually refer until I know specifically what I'm referring to. Or how can we negotiate something? Now you know what my goal is, and I know what your goal is. That's where you start getting into the creative problem solving. 
Which is, yeah, it is. This is why we're here. Because you mentioned something about assumptions and being careful with your assumptions. That's the number one takeaway that I wanted to share. Being a panelist, I want everyone in this room to start thinking about what is your reaction when you catch yourself in an assumption that something, some data point, some reaction, some piece of information just smacked you upside the face and said, no, guess what, you're wrong. Because that's so much of what happens. Is we assume since somebody's there looking for care that they've consented to touch. We assume that because somebody is a lesbian, they have no risk of STDs. We assume that because somebody says that they prefer they pronouns, they must be somewhere on a transition and they're trying to get to one or the other. We assume so much. And the more you can develop self-reflection, the more you can catch yourself in those moments, the better care you're going to get. Because then you don't have the consent accidents, is, is one of the phrases that I've always loved. We have consent accidents all over the place. You didn't mean to do something wrong. You didn't mean to hurt somebody. You didn't mean to make them feel unsafe. But if you did, now you have to go back and repair the relationship. Now you have to take responsibility for restoring that rapport. If you get the chance, <laughs> and that's actually one of the reasons why it's really important to start working on that fast, right? When you notice somebody stiffen, when you notice somebody like kind of going quiet or still, or you see, this is again, back to that idea of trauma-informed care. Sometimes it's very nonverbal, but human beings are really good at reading nonverbals if we let ourselves be, right? And so even just having this in the back of your head, you're going to do better than somebody who hasn't started that self-reflection process. Thank you for the question. And I will also add, September 12th, we are having an LGBTQ health summit. Our grand rounds at noon is trauma-informed um, sexual history taking and um, physical exams. Um, and, and that is our topic because we know that the LGBTQ population has a higher rate of trauma than the general population. So a great opportunity to learn more about what we're, we're talking about right now. So I'd love to see another question from our group here today. Oh, right here in the front, you all are the question asker. So I saw your hand, Max, please go for it. So um, I, majority of my Mm, I might so, put you on the mic. Is that all right? I guess I can just speak louder. Okay. Very, very loud. <laughs> uh, so the majority of my work is in public health research. And so um, my primary focus is in infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. So in understanding LGBT issues, it can be a bit more difficult, obviously, because how do you structure the language? How do you structure the approach? I am less good with the this language makes this person feel really good, and that's, that's how you're going to get a response, and more so just, okay, this is just what happened. I'm very clinical sometimes in my approach. So um, how would you suggest, or what are your thoughts on um, kind of a softer approach to kind of pull more people in? You know, my work isn't so good if I'm not actually getting with people to be yeah, right. able You want the data you exactly. want. You have to get people to answer your questions. Exactly. I mean, by definition, research is invasive. Even the gentlest, like, yeah most touchy-feely research, you're still asking people to uh, uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. No, no, I know, but I also was trying not to dominate that. So that, that was my <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to see who it was. I guess, for me, when, when I hear that question, um, I already do think about um, community um, and Specifically, um, not just a community that you're trying to, like a physical community, um, but like a sense of community, um, even on a one on one type of basis, and erasure, um, which is real. We saw from the numbers um, the trans erasure um, from the research did, um, by circumstance or not. Um, it's real, right? And so it's a very valid question that you ask, how do we reach the unreachable almost, like, if that's the right word. Um, and so community, you have to, you know, understand what communities 
these folks are in, um, in your city, what parts of town these folks are in, what places these folks are going to, are there clubs, are there bars? If there's a specific demographic um, that, that you're trying to reach, um, figure out where those folks go. Start, you know, um, establishing and creating some, some real meaningful relationships with these folks and build a level of trust um, and, and um, gain a better understanding. Um, and, you know, understand that, you know, it's okay if you say the wrong thing. Even if you know you really trigger somebody in a way that you know they don't necessarily want to share space with you anymore, um, use it as a learning experience, you know, and, and, and continue to, to fight to um, establish relationships with people that you can trust and, and engage. Thank you. Adding to that, I think researchers are almost always going to be dependent on some sort of insider. If you don't know how to approach and question and gain the trust of someone in the trans community, because you don't have experience with it, you've not participated in that community, find someone who has. Find somebody who's willing to be your guide and your trusted insider. Have them help you develop the survey. Have them help you pick the targets. Always go to the people who are representing the demographic that you're looking for. We run into this all the time, trying to do research on anybody on um, the neurotypical, non-neurotypical scale, right? The neurodiversity group is notorious for having neurotypical researchers telling us what the autistic person is experiencing. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> Let's try that again, <laughs> right? And the same thing happens here. When you're doing research on disease transfer, infection rates, you won't even understand what the data shows you until you know the influences that are causing that distribution, right? You have to visualize your data. You have to visualize your population first. You have to know who you're looking for and how to reach them. And you may not be able to do that on your own. This is a really good reason to have people working together. OK, great. Um, so yeah, so last question right over here, please go ahead. I, I would like to um, talk about an experience I had last year with going to give plasma. And then um, I was asked the question, and then where it left me feeling at the end because I'm an organ donor. So they, um, when I went last year for the first time to CSF, to, I believe it's CLS plasma, and I went in. Um, and I was asked questions. And I answered all the questions honestly. One of the questions was, have you ever had sexual encounter with a male? Yes. And we proceeded on through the questions. And when, they, when I went through the back, they pricked my finger to do my blood work and everything. And I got over to the lady and she was like, oh. I'm like, what? And she says, your protein levels are too hot so we won't be able to do anything with you today. So I was like, okay, so she said to come back in a day or two. I go back, and when I get there, I don't see the lady. They have me sitting in the lobby waiting. So I, the, um, the doctor, the nurse, she comes out, and she calls me to the back room, and she says that we can't um, do anything with you because you've had sexual encounter with the male since 1970, I think. <laughs> 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 and so the lady, she, you know, we're speaking, and at the same time, I, I felt a little, you know, I was offended, I don't know, um, as like an outcast almost in a way, because I asked her, how many people are actually telling the truth about that question when they come in here? How many men that are coming in here that are honestly answering that question? And why are they not answering the question? How do you all know? And then that made me feel like, OK, I wasn't good enough to get, I know my status. I know I was in good standing. I know that I am in good standing. So I'm not good enough to give plasma or anything. So in other words, 
Does that mean I should just remove off my license as being an organ donor? <laughs> Hmm. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I love the question, and I'm gonna find an answer for you. In the interest of time, what I'm gonna do is ask each one of our panelists to give a very short response, just in response to the story that you shared, because it certainly brings up an emotional response for me in hearing that story of just, let's say, you know, five words or less, just one short response of kind of how that story, what that story brings up for you or how you react to it. I'll start. Same place you are right now, and I got indignant, mm. to say the least. Mm. Didn't do any good, but I got indignant. <laughs> <laughs> Laws and policies are often stupid. This is why we advocate. <laughs> <laughs> I've never voted before. I don't know how to say this, and I absolutely lied. All I got to say is I donate blood every year to blood drive to try to change those laws. A huge thank you to our panelists.
Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm sure there are some people that are like, oh, but I live in that spectrum. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, no. so I think we've come a long way back. That was 